Let's turn over to Mark chapter 4. Is there anybody here that this is your first time you've been here in the five services we've held? Could I see your hand? Those of you, this is your first time? Praise God. Well, welcome. It's amazing. We've had a lot of people come through here this week, if you take um, all the different ones that have been here. And uh, what I started teaching on was out of Ephesians chapter 4. And basically, I've spent the whole weekend just talking about that you've got to quit thinking the way you thought before you got born again. It says in Ephesians 4, 17, don't think as the Gentiles. That's talking about the lost people. When you get born again, it's more than just getting your your, uh, eternal salvation taken care of, but you become a new person in the spirit. Your spirit is perfect. If you get my teaching on spirit, soul, and body, that's what it'll talk about, that you've already got everything in your spirit. You're already healed, you're already blessed. But you didn't get a new brain. You have to change the way you think. In Romans chapter 12, verse uh, 1 and 2, talk about be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we took those scriptures from Ephesians 4, 17. Then I went to Ephesians 4, 18 that says that if you don't begin to think differently, then your understanding becomes darkened. You are alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that's within you. Man, those are major, major statements. I spent all Friday morning talking about that. Then I went over to Genesis chapter 3 and talked about this is how Satan came against Adam and Eve is with words. He came against their thoughts and he got them to think contrary to what God said. The moment you think contrary to God's word, you are going to sin. You are going to fail. You are going to have problems. And so I spent a lot of time talking about that. And this morning, I... uh, got off and basically spent most of the morning talking about Second Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, that everything that pertains unto life and godliness comes through the knowledge of Him. We've got to renew our minds. And this is where so many people are missing it. They're wanting different results, but they aren't going to change the way they think. It's insane to think that you're going to get different results with thinking the same way that you thought before. Proverbs 23, 7, as as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Your life is going the direction of your dominant thought. If you want different results, don't just pray for different results. Don't hope for it. Don't ask somebody else to somehow or another change you and, and, um, you know, uh, give away your authority to somebody else just hoping that they can make things different. It's as simple as changing the way you think. If if you change the way you think, your uh, circumstances, your situations will change. That's what I've been talking about. And here in Mark chapter 4 are some of the most profound scriptures that the Lord ever spoke to me about this. And normally I would teach at least three to four sessions on the parable of the sower sowing the seed. I would preach two or three sessions on the parable in Mark chapter 4 verse 26 and then I'd preach another session on Mark chapter 4 verse 35 and I'm going to try and preach them all tonight. So this ought to be exciting. So let me just say that I'm not going to go into the same depth that I normally go into. I encourage you to get there. I've got a teaching entitled, uh, what is that title? <laughs> a Sure Foundation that would cover a lot of these things. And then I've got a teaching entitled, The Sower Sows the Seed that would cover this. I've got a teaching that is uh, faith builders that would cover some of these. So I've got a lot of teaching that covers this. And if you get spoken to by the Lord tonight, I encourage you to get those other things and go into this more. You know, there's just, there's such a wealth of material on how important the word of God is in renewing your mind that I can't cover it in five sessions. I just couldn't cover it if we spent weeks and weeks here. This is the word of God says this so many different ways, but these are some of the most important things that God has spoken to me. So I want to at least attempt to cover some of these things. In the fourth chapter of the book of Mark, in the first part, the Lord gave a parable about a man who went out and sowed seed. And they didn't sow seed the way we do today, where you dig a furrow and then you space your seed out. This is talking about a man who just had a bag full of seed and he went out and just threw it. He scattered seed everywhere and this seed landed on four different types of ground. And there was a ground that was very hard packed. It was like a path. 
and it couldn't penetrate the ground and the fowls of the air immediately came and ate that seed. Then the second type of ground was a ground where it did penetrate, but there was, it was so many rocks that it didn't have any root and so it didn't last and it, and it didn't bring forth any fruit. The third type of ground was a type of ground where there was a lot of thorns and weeds and the weeds choked it and sapped the nourishment from the seed so it didn't bring forth any fruit to perfection. And then the fourth type of ground was a type of ground that brought forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. And the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, says, why are you teaching in parables? They were sharp enough to know that he wasn't really teaching about how to be a farmer. There was a spiritual application to what he was saying. And he says, why don't you just tell the people what you're saying? And anyway, I'm going to skip this because I could spend a lot of time on this, but there was a reason that he did that. The things of God aren't hidden from his people. They're hidden for his people. And with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will take things and reveal it to you. And God did this so that you will know things that non-believers can't know. The Holy Spirit will explain it. You know, when people come up to me, I bet you I had four or five people tonight who asked me a question and I said, I can't give you the answer to that question. That's what the Holy Spirit is for. Pray in tongues. Let the Holy Spirit tell you what to do. Man, the Holy Spirit will explain things to you if you will allow him. So anyway, one thing I want to point out before we get right into this parable is in verse 13. This is the last thing he said to his disciples in response to why are you teaching these things in parables? And he said unto them, know ye not this parable? And how then will you know all parables? What this is saying is if you don't understand this parable of the sower sowing the seed, you won't understand any parable. This is a key to understanding the teachings of Jesus. In other words, this is a foundational truth. This is one of the most important things. If you can get the truths that were in this parable of the sower sowing the seed, it'll open up everything else that Jesus taught to you. Now that is significant. And so you've got to understand these principles. And then he began to give the interpretation of this parable in verse 14. He says, the sower sows the word. So this parable is really not about sowing seed. It's not about how to grow vegetables. It's about how the word of God works. And if you were to take this, you don't always get this if you just read Matthew and then Mark, Luke, and John. But if you were to take like my living Bible, comment, my, uh, what do we call that? Life for Today Bible Commentary and look at it. I've got the four gospels arranged chronologically so that you have everything side by side. And if you look at it that way, there are actually 13 parables that Jesus taught in one day. And this is just one of those 13 parables. And this is the most teaching from Jesus we have in one day of any place in scripture. And every one of those parables was about a seed, about the word how the word works. So he was, t- he just taught them over and over and over all day long about how the kingdom works. And every one of these parables was about how that the word of God is to the kingdom of God, the way that a seed is to this natural world. Now that is profound. I could preach on that for an hour. Some of you doubt that I could do it, but you can ask. I can preach on this and out. This is powerful. Did you know nothing in this universe, in this world that we know of, operates without seed? Seed is how life exists. It's how this world exists. You wouldn't eat if there weren't seeds. Everything that you eat, fruit, anything, it comes from seed. Animals come from seed. People come from seeds. You are a product of a seed. Without a seed, there is no life. The whole world operates off of seeds. There isn't life. There is nothing that is outside of seeds. And this is significant because, see, he used a natural law that he created. If he would have said, the kingdom of God is like going to school. Did you know that's not a good comparison because you can cheat in school. You can cram for a test probably every person in here has done that where you didn't really pay attention, but the night before your test, you stayed up all night long. You studied, you got this information in your short-term memory and you passed the test, 
But today, five years, 10 years, 20, 30, 40 years, whatever, you don't have a clue what was on that test. You didn't learn it. You crammed for a test. You beat the system. You can, you can cheat in school. You can cram for a test. You can do that with any social man-made system. But you know what? You can't cram for a harvest. You can't cheat this system of seed, time, and harvest. There was a man in one of my Bible studies who was the worst sinner in all of Baca County in, California, in uh, Colorado. And this guy got born again and got so turned on, he started going on the full gospel businessman circuit and speaking, and he got so busy, he didn't have time to farm his land. But he was a faith man. He was supernatural. So he just waited until one week before wheat harvest, and he went out and borrowed $500,000 and planted $500,000 worth of wheat in about 15 sections. There is uh, 640 acres per section. He spent $500,000 on seed one week before weed harvest because he was a faith man and he had been doing what God told him to do. So he just ignored the law of sowing seed time and harvest. And he thought God would give him a supernatural harvest in one week's time. And when his wheat didn't come up and the bank came after him and he didn't have any money, he came to me. Why did God do this? And I said, God didn't do this. There's a time to plant and there's a time to reap and you missed it. And you can't cram for a harvest. You can't sow your seed and just pray over it and supernaturally reap harvest. In the natural, we all look at that and think, you know, that's silly. How dare a person do that? Every one of us in here has done this spiritually. To where we wait until the bankers are at our door, until the doctors told us we're going to die. And then we go and, oh, let's see, what's this scripture? And you go look up a scripture and you pray it real quick. And if you aren't healed within 24 hours, how come God didn't come through? There's seed, time, and harvest. And it's usually seed, time, and then harvest. You have to let the Word of God work. And the Word has to take root on the inside of you. And so this is why the Lord used a seed to illustrate how the Word of God works in our life. The Word of God is powerful. You know, I've got a rock on my property that's twice as tall as this ceiling called Indian Head Rock, and I've chiseled a, a seat on the top of it, and I sit on top of that and watch the rest of the world drive by. Amen. It's really awesome. But anyway, it's this huge chunk of granite. It's probably one-third the size of this room or a quarter the size of this room, and it's just a huge piece of granite. But this huge rock has little dips in it where there's a little, you know, uh, water will get caught in there and then dirt will blow into there. And so there gets to be a little bit of dirt and then a seed lands in there. And that huge boulder is split in two by a seed that landed there. I don't know how it got there. And it split this boulder that must be tons and tons, megatons. It, it little tiny seed split that huge boulder. I couldn't have split that boulder if I'd had a jackhammer. I don't know how it happens, but that's the power that's in a seed. The Word of God is powerful, but it has to come off of this page and get planted in your heart. The Word of God is the seed in the ground. These four different types of ground in this story are talking about the condition of people's hearts. Boy, this is important. I learned this early in my ministry that I'd preach my heart out. And I thought if I was really putting out the word properly, that everybody ought to be changed. Because I thought, man, the word of God is powerful. And I'd see some people just get changed. I've seen people jump up and down on their seat before. They were so excited. They were getting it. They couldn't sit still. And the person next to them falls asleep. And then the next person sitting like this and they don't believe a word that I say. And after a while, my lightning fast mind figured out that, you know what? The same word coming out of my mouth can affect all of these people differently. And I began to realize it's not just the seed. It depends on what kind of ground it's planted in. It depends on the condition of your heart. And so the seed, it says in First 
Peter chapter 2 verse 23 or chapter 1 verse 23, it says that the God's word is an incorruptible seed that we are born by. God's word never fails. It never rots. There is no bad seed from the word, but the problem is there's bad ground. Not everybody's heart receives the word and protects it. And so we don't ever have to worry about the seed, but we do have to consider the condition of our heart. So this tells us about four different types of people. And there, I believe that every person in here fits into one of these four categories. This is all inclusive. And I also believe that these are four stages. I don't think anybody just automatically becomes good ground. You start, everybody starts out in this first stage and then you progress to the second stage, the third stage, and finally the fourth stage where you begin to start bearing fruit. You can't skip these things. You've got to work through all of these problems. And so the very first type of person in verse 15, it says, and these are they by the wayside where the word is sown, who when they have heard uh, immediately, or excuse me, when they have heard Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. So this first type of person is a person that the word never penetrated their understanding. It didn't get down in their heart. It just stayed on the surface and Satan had free access. Satan was only able to steal the word from one out of these four different types of people. And that's the person that was first represented. And I'm not going to take time. I'm trying to hurry through this. But if you compare this with Matthew chapter 13, verse 19, which is the exact same story over there. It says, these are those who understand not. And Satan comes immediately and steals the word out of their heart. So you put these together. You find that what happened was the person's understanding was darkened. Go back to the very first scriptures that I used on Thursday night in Ephesians chapter four, verse 17. Don't be as the Gentiles are like a lost man who walk in the vanity of their mind, verse 18, having the understanding darkened. If you don't begin to renew your mind by the word of God and change your paradigm and way of thinking, then it just makes you spiritually dull to where the word never penetrates. It just doesn't make any sense to you. And Satan can steal it from a person like that. You have got to present the word of God in a way that it connects with the person. They understand it and it gets below the surface or Satan will have it before they're out the door. This is why we have children's church. You don't change what you're saying. You still teach the word, but you know what? You don't use the illustration about marriage or about going to work every day or about, you know, old age and going into nursing homes. Four and five-year-olds don't relate to that. So you use illustrations that relate to them and you present it in a way that they can understand the principles. You don't change the message, but you change the way it's presented. You know, when I'm speaking to people overseas that don't understand Americanisms and don't understand our culture, I don't use the same illustrations that I use here. You've got to present things in a way that people understand it. You use illustrations that they understand. You'd think that ought to be obvious, but it just amazes me how so many preachers today think that if they are really deep, that, it, that you ought to have to bring a dictionary with you to the church service and they use all of these $5 words that nobody understands and theological terms and they think that somehow or another this is smart. You know what I think is really good is when a person can talk on anybody's level. I don't care if you're an intellectual or an idiot. You can understand what they're saying. That's a good communicator. You've got to communicate in a way that people understand what you're saying. I can stand for people to reject what I'm saying, but I can't stand for them not to get what I'm saying. That's a reflection on me. If they don't like it, they can reject it, but they ought to at least understand my point. I'm blunt sometimes to the point of being brutal, but people do know what I'm trying to say. Amen. So anyway, the first type of person, you've got to get them to understand or Satan just steals it from them. Then in Mark chapter four and in verse 16, it says, and these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who, when they have heard the word immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves and so endure, but for a time afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. 
I could spend hours on this passage because this is where Jamie and I were when the Lord first spoke this to me. We were in a situation where the word was in our heart. We had understood it. We were trying to walk in it, but it hadn't become our revelation. We were preaching other people's revelation. And we just got so excited about it. Notice it says, this is, these are the types of people who they receive it with gladness. Man, we were excited and we were out quoting and we would quote this person. This person said this and we were preaching their revelation. And for a week or two, things would go good. And then after I got criticized, this is still when I was in a Baptist church and I was told that I was of the devil and you can't preach this stuff. And the pastor would come sit and listen to what I'm saying and sit there and try and intimidate me into not preaching anything that didn't square with the Baptist theology. And after a few weeks of that, I'd still be saying the same things, but it was just lifeless. And it happened so often that I knew it was going to happen. I knew that for a week or so things would be good. And then it had just ceased to be good. And I couldn't figure out why. And the Lord spoke this to me and he says, it's because you don't have root in yourself. And when affliction and persecution come, you lose your commitment to it. Now, I didn't lose my intellectual knowledge of it. If you were to ask me, I'd still say, but I wasn't excited about it, bold about it, because I didn't have root in myself. And man, this changed my life when I saw this and I made a decision that I'm not going to quote other people. I'm not saying I don't listen to other people, but I'll listen to them until, and then I'll take that to God and I'll let God speak it to me and it'll become rooted on the inside of me. Yeah, I don't know if any of you have listened to me much, but if you've listened to me, I very seldom quote other people. And it's not because I don't respect other people or, or receive what they say, but I just learned decades ago not to preach another man's revelation. I hear it and then it becomes my revelation and God spoke it to me and it's mine. And this is the way you've got to be. And there's a lot of people that are just, you, you hear somebody preach it and so you go say in the name of Jesus and the devil says, Jesus, I know, and Andrew, I know, but who are you? You don't have the word rooted on the inside of you and you have to make the word personal and it takes time to get root. Man, I've got so many examples on this. Like I said, I could preach on this for hours. I want to just hit this and go on, but this is where most people miss it. They do not take time. Roots go at least twice, sometimes three and four times as deep below the ground as the plant is above the ground. Most people are wanting the growth above the ground. They're wanting to see prosperity, healing, victory, joy, peace, flowing in the Holy Spirit, all of these things. They're looking for this growth and yet they got a root that deep. I was in Vietnam and it's a very long story, but man, I remember this day. It was a major turning point in my life and I was elected to be bunker guard while everybody else went through the gas chamber. Thank you, Jesus. Man, I'd prayed for that. And I was just laying on my bunker guarding everybody's stuff. And I was reading this exact passage of scripture. And in this same chapter, look down here in verse 30. This is Mark chapter four, verse 30. Here's another parable about the seed. It says, where unto shall we liken the kingdom of God or with what comparison shall we compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when it is sown in the earth is less than all the seeds that be in the earth. But when it is sown, it groweth up and becometh greater than all herbs and shooteth forth great branches so that the fowls of the air may come and lodge under the shadow of it. This is talking about growth that you may have the very smallest. A mustard seed is tiny. You may have the smallest, you may feel the most insignificant, but the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed and it grows and becomes the biggest of all of the herbs. And I was laying there reading this passage and I thought, God, that's what I want to be. I want to have growth so that I could touch other people, so that the fowls of the air could come land in my branches, so that I could give shade to people, so that I could impact lots of people. And I was praying for that. And the Lord spoke to me and he says, you know, your root is about that deep. And if I gave you all of this growth and if you became this huge tree, the first bird to land in a branch, the whole thing would fall over. It says the first puff of wind that came, you would fall over and you'd be dead. 
He says, it's because I love you that I haven't given you the growth. You got to get the growth below the surface. You got to get the seed rooted in you. And he says, if you would just take care of getting the word in you and let it take root, then I can guarantee you that the rest of it will grow. And it gave me direction for the rest of my life. And I have since then not prayed for growth. I've prayed God help me to get the word in my heart and I take it. And if you ever let the word root in your heart, I guarantee you it will produce the things that you need. I use this example when I was receiving an offering earlier this week. But you know, when you plant an apple seed, you don't ever see that apple seed groaning, travailing. You'll never hear it scream. You'll never see the tree shake and then go, ah, and here's an apple. It's just the nature of a seed to produce if you put it in the ground. And if you put God's word in and meditate in it day and night and day and night and sleep and rise night and day and it'll just work. It's the nature of the word to change you. It's the nature of the word of God to produce healing in your body, to produce joy in you, to give you a different outlook, to cause you to flow in the anointing of God. Anything that you need in your life will come out of this. This is a seed. But in the same way as you would think a woman is absolutely crazy if she was praying for children and wanted children and she never had a physical relationship with a man, you'd think this is crazy. There was only one virgin birth. You aren't going to be the second one. <laughs> if we saw a person go out and lay on their ground and pray over their ground and fertilize the ground and water the ground, but if they never planted a seed, we'd think that person's crazy. And yet we see Christians all of the time begging God to heal me. Oh God, prosper me. Oh God, move in my life. Oh God, heal my marriage. And if you came and said, well, what scripture are you standing on? What seed have you planted? They say, uh, see, what are you talking about? Do you have a promise? Oh, well, I've heard that. I can't remember if it's in the Old Testament or the New Testament, but uh, somewhere, doesn't it say by his stripes we were healed? Something like that. And you wonder why you aren't healed? You couldn't even find the scripture if you needed to. You have to have more intercourse with the word than that. You have to have the word become alive to you. And you've got to know what the word says. And yet there are vast numbers of people right here in this room that you are desiring God to do something. And right now, if I was to say, what scripture do you, promises you what you're believing for? What seed have you planted in your life? You couldn't tell me a scripture. And you wonder why you aren't receiving. That's as crazy as a woman who wants children and will not have a physical relationship. That's as crazy as a person who wants crops and they will not plant a seed. And it's amazing. People will go to great effort. They will fast. They will get hundreds of people to agree with them. They will stay up all night long praying and wailing and begging and pleading and go through great effort when all you had to do is just plant a seed, amen, and give it some time and it would just automatically change you. Boy, that is powerful. If, if we really believe this, we have millions and millions of seed, hundreds of seed for whatever your need is. If you really believed and understood what I was talking about, it's as simple as going to the Word, finding out what those seeds are, putting them in your heart, meditating on it, speaking it, and you just give it time. And I guarantee you, you're going to be changed. It's, it's that simple. And if you really believe this, there's no reason that in a year's time, two years' time, every person in here couldn't be hitting all on all cylinders, walking in victory, seeing miracles happen. It's that simple. It is not based on anything. You know, one of the things that blessed me about this whole teaching was that I was a dropout of school. I never was the sharpest knife in the drawer. I've never been special about anything I've done. And, and the way that I was raised, you had to have special charisma. You had to be an outgoing personality. You had to be, I don't know, you, you had to be all the stuff that I wasn't. And I was just feeling like, God, how could you ever use me? And when the Lord showed me this parable, I realized it's the seed that produces the fruit, not the ground. The seed's what's got the life in it. The se All you got to do is just get the seed in you and don't let anything steal it from you. And as I'll go through this parable, you'll see it's not the ground that had more that produced the most fruit. It was the ground that had less. 
less rocks, less thorns, less weeds. And I thought, God, if, if being less is what causes you to use us more, I can be less. I'm not sure I can be more, but I could be less. <laughs> Amen. I may not be able to have the charisma of somebody else, but I guarantee you, I can devote myself to the word of God. I can learn the word of God. I can put the time into it. And man, I have just for 44 years saturated myself with the word of God and it has revolutionized my life. That's what this parable is teaching. The second type of person is a person who received the word, but they didn't take time for it to get rooted. They wanted this big tree with zero root. And it's because God loves you that he doesn't give you that growth because you couldn't sustain it. Thank you.